Um, and I, I think that's a good segue to, to maybe go into the international real estate properties. Um, sure. And I, I heard from what I heard from my other friend, Juan, uh, he was staying in a place where you're able to invest some of your money into the place that you're staying and they give you a share or a return of it so that if you do decide to buy in the future, the cost of it is a little bit less. And I thought that was a very interesting model. And that, that was yeah, the first really cool. I've ever heard of. And um, this was down in Monterrey, Mexico. Um, I'm curious about what other uh, international real estate things uh, have crossed your path. So some things with international real estate, you have to be careful with buying property regardless of the country. So a lot of places they might have cheaper home prices, but they might not offer 30 year mortgages. Right now, interest rates in the United States are at very, um, are very low right now. So other countries, they don't have 30 year mortgages. They don't have very low interest rates. So it's something to be aware of. And then other places uh, like Mexico, they have rules that restrict foreigners on buying property, especially if it are within the beach or a border zone, it has to be owned by a trust and that can get pretty nitty gritty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I know of some other countries where it's, it's pretty easy to get into the country itself. Um, just becoming like a, you know, a daily, a citizen almost, but not really a citizen. And mm -hmm. I don't know. I think I think it's a, an avenue worth pursuing, especially now that the housing market in the U.S. is just getting really high. And for so for oh, someone yeah. who's whole, who just wants something small, like a hundred or one hundred and fifty, you know, you, I don't think you can find something that in a in a good city, at least in a decent city. You can in the U.S. or even less. I mean, kind of a fun fact: my dad is a retired dentist. He's really savvy with finances. He's taught me a ton. And he retired from his practice a few years ago, uh, used the equity to buy some rental property in Georgia or not Georgia, Florida, pardon me. Mm -hmm. But I know in a lot of the Southern states and kind of the Midwestern areas, there are affordable properties. Some can be as low as forty, fifty thousand dollars I mean, granted they're kind of rural areas. Mm -hmm. It is out there, but it's fine. The time we were speaking the other day about this and you thought Texas was high. Dude, come to California. It's even <laughs> higher. I mean, California, five hundred thousand dollars. That's like a shack out here. And I mean, someday I would like to have property. I mean, granted, I'm still young, and that will take some time. But it's scary. Like I look at some of my friends, one of which, one of which is my age. I mean, he's bought some property. He has a house on Lakeside, and he's he's house poor. He's just stressed every month. And it's hard for him to like even keep his head above water and yeah. they don't want that. And other people I know they're looking at houses are like, Oh yeah, a million dollars. That's a starter home. I was like, it's not a starter <laughs> home. Like I don't want to, I don't know if it makes sense to even get involved with one of those houses as long. Well, it might, if you are really establishing your career and like you're earning a lot of income, but it's, it's even worse in California, man. Yeah. Oh, it's funny you say that. Cause uh, I heard once that, the word mortgage actually means death pact. So yeah, <laughs> I thought that was kind of ironic. <laughs> and, yeah. And it's kind of funny though, like mortgage, it comes from, I think there's a French word, uh, le, le mort, which is like death. It's kind of like the Spanish, like muerte. Ah, okay. It's kind of like a similar concept. <laughs> I thought that was funny. And so I, I think we're both along the same understanding that we don't want to invest our whole lives into this one property. And we have no. we're just bound to it by 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 debt. And I would rather just go off somewhere else and say, Oh, okay, here's here's maybe I don't know, fifty thousand and then I'll you know, I'll you know, I'll pay the rest of it off later to the bank trust or depends on how which one you're looking at. But um another thing I was thinking about was is it actually worth investing here in the US, right? And then just renting that out? And then using that money to live somewhere else that's cheaper because that way you still have a foothold in the u.s but you're able to travel and stay somewhere else as you'd like it for the rest of the year or something like that what are your yeah thoughts? that could that could work that's not a bad idea and i'm gonna get a little bit more technical here yeah but you can use a program called an fha loan 
which will let you buy property for as low as 3.5% down. I mean, granted, there are other costs like mortgage insurance. We can actually put a link to this in the description below if you want to read more. Mm -hmm. um, you can use an FHA loan for a low down payment. You can maybe buy a condo or some sort of duplex and you can rent out the other rooms to tenants. That's something called house hacking. My cousin has actually done this in California. And that's something that I've thought about doing in the future. I mean, I don't want to have a bunch of people living with me indefinitely. Right. But one thing I've considered is, say, finding a uh, two to three unit um, kind of complex. The two units would be attached so i would live in the one and kind of my own space and then I have, i'd have tenants so the tenants would pay my uh housing bills and then hopefully i might have a little left over which can be uh, a passive income yeah um i've heard something along this line too on one of the youtube finance channels that i've i've watched before he compared basically his property where he let someone else rent it out and then he or he took that same amount of money and he put it into um, one of these crowdfunding platforms. And he said at the end of the day, it was less of a headache for him with a crowdfunding platform versus actually having a property because there's always some upkeep to it, right? Emergency maintenance, uh, you know, the tenants. Yeah, there's are a lot to real estate. I mean, yeah. my dad's told me this, like if something breaks, like if a roof breaks or there's a water leak or if your tenant is just being flighty or if they're not paying then that's on you i mean there's a lot of responsibility i mean granted real estate is a key tool for building wealth mm -hmm. but no tim i agree with you you, you touched on a very, very important point there are platforms like fundrise and other uh real estate crime platforms where you can invest a little bit even as low as 500 dollars, and you can still have real estate exposure and then mm -hmm. on that same kind of kind of note you can also invest in uh, real estate investment trusts and real estate investment trust funds like REIT ETFs. Mm -hmm. Vanguard is one, low cost, high dividend. So that's something to consider too. I mean, granted, it's not the same as getting that monthly cash flow, but you still have exposure. It's something at least. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So with a, I guess we're, we're over to crowdfunding, uh, crowdfunding platforms. And uh, so something I've participated in is Fundrise. And I've yeah, tried a little bit of Acorn as well. Um, I haven't really put stats out because I'm still testing with it. But I got to say, it's been pretty low maintenance so far. And their fee, like their maintenance fee was like a buck or two or something. For yeah, I, I have Acorns. It's a really nice, it's a nice app. Yeah. Um, and I, I know there's some other ones out there. I, I did a little quick Google search, and besides Fundrise, there's things like Prodigy and iFunding. Um, it's probably worth looking into if you have a lot of capital. But I guess for, for my purposes, as, as I am, I'm, I think I'm looking towards more like maybe real estate at this point in time, like something low, like 50000 or so in another country. Um, I think to seriously do some damage with these crowdfundings you might have a, a higher capital to, to put yeah, in there, that makes sense. right I, I think that's just my reasoning um what do you what do you think about kind of allocating towards how much percentage or how much should you invest your time into these crowdfunding platforms or if you tried them before even i haven't tried them i want to but i would say not to invest tons of money not like all of your investable assets. I think what will be helpful is investing in items like a 401k. I mean, not like everything in a 401k, but considering Roth IRAs for tax-free growth long-term. Mm -hmm. So you always have to think of tax advantages and just simplicity and mm -hmm. also liquidity as well. So I mean, consider different types of accounts so you can have a little bit of real estate, a little bit of stocks. I mean, again, we're not advisors, so we're not right. going to say this is your asset allocation. Right. But um, yeah, it's just something to consider. I think generally portfolios have between five to 10% of their assets in real estate, but it, uh, it varies. Okay. And yeah, I think the main 
main bread and butter is still having a service, a skill that you can sell. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the way to do it. I mean, we were talking about this last time, but we both noticed that all these, I say, gurus, they're all trying to sell like courses for a grand or two and they're scamming people. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually kind of sad. Mm -hmm. And I mean, granted, I bought online courses that have been helpful. But even those, it's the same thing. They just charge a lot for information you can find for a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. But one thing I've realized is if you want to be able to live as a nomad or have more freedom and a good income, then start a service-based business. So you could do writing, marketing, web development, uh, anything like that, something that, that can be done remotely. Either get your own clientele or work for an employer. And then sales could be included in those skills too. Yeah, and and so They're along these these uh these gurus that you don't um you know you can always do things your own way. It's like going with a guru route. Uh, it's it's almost like the the safety route. But with this kind of thing, I yeah. feel like you need to actually risk it to learn, make mistakes, and just yeah, you have yourself. to. It's all about trial and error. I, I really think that's what it is, and I think that's what discourages most people. They just want a uh, a guide, a quick way to to get money, but. If you actually put in the time and the hard work to take that Udemy course or, or that LinkedIn learning course or whatnot to, to learn about people, to learn about the business and your skills, I think that stretches further in the long run than just saying it really does. You know, here's the platter. You can just take it. So and one thing I've discovered too, Tim, and in other courses, I don't want to name names. I mean, I want to be respectful, but in other courses, they have so-called blueprints and guides. And if you look into the blueprints, then it's like, oh, here's the topic, but it doesn't really go into the information. It's like, oh, go to this area. Like this is where you can learn. So it's just getting content from other sources. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because there's this one course that talked about, oh, copywriting, but I went through like their little blueprint and it didn't say anything about like formulas or how to write like benefit driven headlines or anything like that. I mean, to learn that, I, I used Udemy. I wrote my own sample or spec ads, landing pages, mm -hmm. a lot of practice. I would go through blogs, even getting books like those by uh, Gary Halper, very helpful. Mm -hmm. So just things of that nature. So like learning the fundamentals, like, okay, this is what AIDA, that formula means and how you can use that to write a sales page or mm -hmm. an ad. Yeah. So I, I guess like this point in time uh, of our lives, like it's it's worth developing that skill and then whatever yeah. money you have left over, like look at these other options as well. Um, that's kind of what I'm focusing on is just skill, a skill, something active, something passive. I'm not yeah, all like, passive. It's, it's, it's like you got to be diverse, right? Yeah, you can't do it all passive. I mean, <laughs> I still kind of laugh. And I mean, even a few years ago, I was more gullible. I wasn't as wise. And I'd kind of fall for these ads that said, oh, make 10 grand on Amazon in a few <laughs> months or do this Shopify drop shipping or affiliate marketing. I mean, it was insane, like all the stuff I mm -hmm. signed up for. I didn't really buy the courses, but I would sign up for their presentations and do all this kind of stuff. And no, I mean, I realized that it's it didn't take it's kind you. Yes. Yeah. It didn't take yeah, you it's anywhere. <laughs> and it's hard. It's hard to like actually get enough passive income, like let's just say three grand a month. Mm -hmm. like after taxes like it's hard to get that amount consistently and passive without doing any work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. granted passive income i mean gary v had a good video it's like passive income you just take money that can go to zero you put it in the markets and real estate and like grow long term those are the best ways to do it mm -hmm. i mean i'm not saying those methods like affiliate marketing and drop shipping and amazon you know, those are valid like i actually know a couple people that they do amazon for a living Mm. but it's not passive like it is not passive no. like they do a lot of work there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes it's not like you slap up a product and you're making 10 grand another thing i wanted to add especially with e-commerce is you have to think about margin like mm. your gross margin and net profit so if someone says oh i made ten thousand dollars in a month a general profit margin would be maybe around 20 percent. like that's net after like your product costs, advertising fees, Amazon seller fees, like all this stuff, like product giveaways, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, broker fees if necessary. So 20% is fairly typical. So if you say, oh, I grossed 10 grand, you might be only taking home 
two thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Mm-hmm. Like that bottom line that we were talking about before. Yeah. After taxes, all of that. So yeah, like, your gross profit versus like your net what you actually take home before taxes. Right. I mean, it's crazy. People might say, "Oh yeah, like I grossed um, like twenty grand," but if you only brought home two, then it's different. Right. <laughs> Um, so I think that's most of kind of the things you can do from your end. Um, I, I wanted to just touch on some maybe unique business ideas that you've come across in other countries, like maybe one or two that you've seen maybe from people from other countries come to that con- come to a, a third world country and they, they kind of set something up for themselves. Um, I'll, I'll go first uh, since I brought it up. There was a, a gentleman from Canada and he was down in Colombia, specifically uh, Santa Marta. And he set up a hostel, basically. And he didn't have that much really money. Cool. I always wanted to go there. Yeah. It's, it's a nice uh, little beach town. And, and uh, just definitely check it out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. He didn't have much money to begin with. So he, he started what he could with the capital that he had. But when we got there, when we booked a room there, he was essentially still building it out. But he still he had a place to stay. And one of the interesting things he said was he started buying um, just soda, for example, or beer or something. And his neighbors would ask to buy it from him because they were they had a, a little, you know, shop or tiendita or something like that where they're trying to mm-hmm. just sell little things. And like you would never think like uh, it's, it's not like here in the States where you buy something, it's yours and, and, and you just keep it like there's other people. That actually want what you have too so i thought the world is a little bit different in these third world countries it is right selling being able to sell on the streets you know you set up like your little um taco stand on the street or something you can do that yeah too. fruit shops i would <laughs> love getting fruit and cardano like fresh mango and watermelon and no it was all really good but yeah tim you're right i mean there are a lot less restrictions for the united states like where you have to have like permits like all this kind of stuff it can be very limiting and another thing I like about some of those countries, people are more open and warm. I mean, they want to build relationships and like kind of get to know you and help you. I mean, it's not like dog eat dog and mm-hmm. it's not as much as a fight as it is here. It's, I think it's a little bit of a lighter investment into, in order mm-hmm. to start something. Whereas here, I feel like you have to get a brick and mortar store or get the, the, the doing business as and um, all these tax things. But over there, you just yeah. go on the street corner and start doing your thing, you basically. Do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because sometimes I feel sorry for some of the people down there just because wages are very low. I mean, it's common for some of the local people to really grind, like yeah. kind of bust their, their butts for maybe 10 to $20 a day. And they're working 40, 50 hour weeks. And sometimes they do this kind of stuff out of necessities, like selling street food and things of that nature, even clothes out of their home, they do have necessity just because the wages are so low. And I respect their innovate, innovation and entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I put a blame on myself too, but I complain like, oh, our 40 hour work week is, is a lot. And I come down there and I, I come home at night and I see these people getting off the buses at eight or 9 p.m. in the evening from the markets or wherever another town over or something and i'm like my eight hour day was nothing compared to their 12 or yeah that's nothing <laughs> it's not like a 12 hour day i mean one thing i've heard is like in those countries they don't even have saturdays off it's like mm-hmm. monday through saturday 12 hour days you're making i think like two dollars an hour if that i mean it's interesting because like we like to travel and we like the adventures and American dollars and euros go far down there. I mean, we can have a really cool lifestyle, but a lot of the local people, they struggle mm-hmm. and that causes strife. I mean, I feel bad for them. And there's a reason why a lot of them struggle. They uh, will do anything to get to the United States or a more developed area. Cause even minimum wage, like $12 an hour, like that's a pretty good deal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I guess the, the second example I have is, is related to this. So in order to help out those people, a couple of my other friends and I were talking about importing their goods and bring it over to the U.S. to sell. And 
um, it's another possible way for a, a side gig. You don't have to put in, you know, you don't have to make a killing in order to survive, especially no. if you're living down there. So there, there's all these interesting models out there that I'm, I'm always curious to learn about. And uh, yeah, and maybe that's something I'll perfu- pursue in the future. But um, right now, it just... Yeah, I've seen other people doing that, like selling goods. Like there's some YouTubers, they sell like um, bars and goods. They don't have the some of the profits it's like the local people and they want to help them they want to get them higher sales in american dollars and mm-hmm. build those communities i think it's really really great mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um do you have anything else on this topic um just business ideas you've seen or what people have done in other countries uh business ideas not really i think one of the best things you can do is like an online job or an online business because you're detached and it's not as restri- it's not as restrictive, but some ideas could be to start a, a surf school, a surf school, or like <laughs> renting out sports equipment. I mean, I think kiteboarders can do pretty well. I was in Cartagena last year, and they had kiteboarding, and it was not cheap. So those are just some things that come to mind. Mm-hmm. All right, yeah. There's it's just I guess you're limited by your imagination. What kind of hobbies you're interested yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um. We're going to circle back to, I guess, the last topic here. Uh, I wanted to talk kind of just briefly about stocks. I know it's been around for sure. ages. Um, I'm participating in something called M1 Finance, and I'm just investing um, just some some change just to see how how it uh, it grows. Um, just S&P 500 is what I've been into, and it's been kind of turbulent, especially with our current times. Oh, yeah, with everything that's going on. <laughs> Um, but I think I'm in it for the long term, so <clears throat> I'm just letting it grow, and it's it's slowly picking back up recently. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, do you see the stock market as a, a good mid range game, not not a short range game, not like day day trading or anything, and not like no. waiting until you're 65 years old. I'm talking more about like the five to yet ten year mark, maybe where you can actually make a little bit of money. Is that a viable I think it could strategy? Be. I think it could be. Mm-hmm. It just, um, you might have to be a little bit more conservative. Like if the goal is five to 10 years out, then instead of investing in like pot stocks or other small caps, then maybe look towards fairly stable companies like Coca-Cola mm-hmm. that pay dividends. Companies that have been around forever, they don't have a lot of price fluctuation. I mean, that's something to consider. Uh, it's, it is, it is out there. I mean, it's definitely more riskier with a shorter time frame, but yeah, it's it's a possibility. I uh, Motley Fool sent me something recently, like, "Oh, invest in these five stocks because that they're going to be the next Netflix or something like that." Yeah, I've seen those, <laughs> and I, I I feel like they're always hype. They're hype, you know, uh, media, and they're just trying to get people to throw money their way. But um, yeah. I don't know. I, in, in general, the stock market has always evaded me. Um, I've never really gotten into it as much, but I'm playing it for the long term, so I feel relatively more comfortable than just like... Yeah, and that's the e- easiest way to approach it, just long term, buy and hold, uh, simple. You don't have to do anything convoluted, no day trading, no options, nothing like that, Yeah. or Forex. Yeah, um, cool. I, that covers what I have here. Is there any points that we've missed or you wanted to bring up before we uh No, we covered up? a lot. This was pretty <laughs> extensive. I mean, granted, we have some resources in the description about the FEIE, um, FHA other, loans, kind of, FICA tax. Yeah, FHA loans, mm-hmm. yeah, those those taxes. We can talk about um, the affiliate link for Chase in the description. And then if you want my contact, my Facebook and my writer site, then uh, yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, um, we'll get that squared away and we'll put everything in the description for people to, to find more easily. And yeah, it's been great talking to you. It's always uh, an yeah, interesting- Yeah, thanks, likewise, Tim. Awesome conversation. So- you Yeah, know, it was awesome. Down the line here, uh, you know, if we get a little bit more time, we might make something more in depth. Like it's talk specifically yeah, about, yeah, you know, foreign earning income exclusion or something like that. But yeah. um, that's all I got. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And uh, let me sign off here and uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks, Delton. All right.
So you've probably already seen part one, but if you haven't, feel free to hop back and check it out. We talk about things like the Foreign Earned Income Exclusion, FEIE, or different tax breaks, or also traveling with credit card points and the cards that we've used. And all these things will help you benefit as a digital nomad or an expatriate. And if you've already seen both, thanks so much for hanging with us.